Okay, so let's get started. My, um, um, as everyone mentioned, my goal uh, yeah, during the time that I'll be talking to you is to give you some background about the, state, the issue of minority languages um, around the world, a kind of global picture. Um, and I'm going to take as the place that I start um, the, the, the cover of a recent book um, published in which, um, Dolby 2002, in which he says, and this is a quotation, a language dies every two weeks. What are we going to do about it? It's a fairly dramatic statement to, to make that um, languages are, are disappearing so rapidly. So let's have a look at the issues that he summarizes here. Firstly, languages are disappearing. There are predictions of extreme loss of languages everywhere around the world. I want to then have a look at some possible responses to that situation. And if we have time towards the end, I'll give you an example of uh, a case study, the project that I have been involved in, um, looking at revitalizing language and then sum up some of the experiences that um, we have um, accumulated over the last um, 20 years or so. If we look at <laughs> the languages around the world, there's a very uh, skewed distribution. The top 10 languages are the ones that you see up there on the screen, and they have hundreds of millions of speakers. At the top, Mandarin Chinese, uh, please do not uh, believe that these numbers are anything like exact. They're meant to give you a, a kind of ballpark uh, idea of, of the rough areas. So the figures here come from um, uh, Dolby's book and, and various other sources, and we have the top 10. Um, I apologize to Fernand. I should have gone to the top 11, because then French fits in. But, uh, <laughs> of these languages, there are... Um, three, which we could call as multinational languages. Um, that is, languages that are used across many different nations. Um, and there we have Arabic, Spanish, and English. And of course, English is, is special in that it is the global language of global communication. The top nine of these languages all have over 100 million speakers. And together, they constitute 40% of the world's population. This is striking. Only nine languages are spoken by 40% of the world's population. The top 20 have half, more than half the world's population. So what we have <coughs> is a very small number of very large languages with uh, the majority of the world's population only speaking 20 languages. This is a figure that uh, the sort of aphorism that, that David Crystal uh, popularized, 4% of the world's languages are spoken by 96% of the world's population. There's something like 7,000 languages spoken on Earth today. And only 4% of those, that's about 250 or so, is spoken by 96% of the world's population. That means 96% of the world's linguistic diversity is in the hands of just 4% of its population. These are typically small communities living in isolated locations in places like Papua New Guinea or the Pacific or South America. 50% of the world's languages have, have less than 10,000 speakers and 25%, a quarter, have less than 1,000 speakers. So what we have then is a small number of very large languages and a large number of very small languages, and that's the current demographic distribution. In addition, there have been radical reduction in speaker numbers in the last 40 years or so, really since the Second World War. The number of speakers of indigenous languages has plummeted in all areas of the world, and the age profiles of speakers have moved to be older and older and older. So what you're finding is that minority languages, these small languages of that show the huge diversity of the world, are spoken by decreasing numbers of older and older people. And in 1992, Michael Krauss made the proposal that in the coming century, that is the 21st century where we are now, that will see the death of 90% of the world's linguistic diversity. 
only 600 odd, 700 languages will be left at the end of this century. And then um, the rest will be gone. Now this is a pretty radical estimate, pretty extreme. And that's how you get Dolby's number. If you take 90% and then divide it by a century, you get one every two weeks. Um, of course, the response from people that they'll say is, which is the one that's going next week? We can go and say that. <laughs> Obviously, these are averages. And what we're going to see, of course, is that the numbers will rapidly increase. So either they'll, they'll, the graph is actually um, a very steep curve later in the century. Even the most conservative estimates place language loss at 50% of the world's languages. So it's something between 50 and 90. So only 3,000 languages are going to disappear. This is amazing. You compare this to, to, to endangered plants and endangered animals. Do you know what the percentage of endangered bird species is today? 2%. 2% of bird species are considered to be endangered. We're talking between 50 and 90% of languages and cultures are endangered. It's totally... Uh, um, different from the situation with plants and animals and, um, and uh, those species. When we look at geographical distributions, we also find that they are very skewed. Some parts of the world uh, show amazing linguistic diversity. And here we see Africa and Asia at the top, and Europe very far behind in terms of the number of different languages that are spoken. And you can see the speaker numbers there. The, again, these figures are, are, are rough. So what this shows us then is that the greatest diversity is in Africa, South and Southeast Asia, followed by Papua New Guinea, a single island with three million people that speaks over a thousand languages. So amazing diversity in a place like Papua New Guinea, and then North America and Europe down at the end. Languages can be classified into groups, into families. So most of the languages of Europe belong to a single family. In fact, the languages of Europe and uh, through to Iran, to uh, Afghanistan, to, to Asia, to India and Pakistan belong to a single family called the Indo-European family. So English and Hindi are related uh, ancestrally. If we look at how many families there are in the world, this is the picture that emerges. South America has 93 different families. Amazing diversity in terms of, of different, wildly different languages. So you can go a very short distance up the Amazon and find languages that are totally, totally different from one another. North America has 50. Papua New Guinea, I said 40 plus. The reason is we simply don't know for many Papua New Guinean languages how they should be grouped or classified because we don't know enough about them. And then finally down to Europe, again at the bottom, and um, the Pacific. So again, this is a, you can see the, the amazing distributions in terms of massive diversity um, in the Americas and in Papua New Guinea again, and decreasing diversity um, in the other parts of the world. Um, when we look at um, community, speaker communities, we can see that there are a number of factors involved that can give us a picture of an individual community. The first of these is intergenerational language transmission. That's just a fancy way of saying, are children learning this language? And what we're finding increasingly, particularly in minorities, is that children are not learning the language of their parents, but they're learning the language of a wider society, of their neighbors or of the nation. So if intergenerational transmission is low, then the language is going to be threatened in terms of passing it on. A second issue is the percentage of speakers within the total population. I was quoting total figures before. I said so many languages with a thousand speakers or less and so on. What's really important is the proportion of a community who speak the language. So amongst the Navajo, for example, the Navajo is the largest tribe in the United States with something like 150,000 members. But the proportion who speak Navajo is actually small. Particularly, the proportion of children who speak Navajo is almost non-existent now. It's shocking to know that the biggest tribe 
with the largest language in the US is very threatened in terms of children. So it's proportions that we have to be concerned with, not absolute numbers. So there are groups in Papua New Guinea who have only 500 speakers, but the language is perfectly strong and, and everybody speaks it, all children are learning it, it's used on an everyday basis. The proportion there is 100% are speaking it. With other uh, organized situations, we're talking about much lower percentage figures. The third important factor is domains and functions of language use. By domain, we mean the situations within which a particular language is used. In the home, in religious cer ceremonies, in uh, community meetings, in dealing with the government, in dealing with edu education. Each of those are different domains. And when we look at those domains, we can see what functions is the language performing. The fourth important issue is language attitudes and the ideology of the wider community. So minorities are embedded within a larger community. What attitude does the larger community have towards minority languages? One possibility might be to simply say, well, let them do whatever they want, we don't care, a kind of laissez-faire attitude. Another attitude might be, those bloody minority people speaking those silly languages, why don't they stop and speak a proper language like English or Spanish or Chinese or one of those big top ones that we saw. So that's the kind of attitude that we find in the United Kingdom, for example. Increasingly now, is minorities should give up their languages and start speaking English. It used to be laissez-faire, but since 7-7, when we had the huge bombings, um, there has been a, a big shift, much more towards looking at suppressing um, languages. The fifth important factor here is speakers' attitudes towards their own language. That is, what is the minority's view about their own language? Is it something that they want to keep? Is it something valuable? Or do they say things like, and you increasingly hear this, oh, it's not a proper language. It's just a dialect. You can't even write it down. We haven't got a way to write our language. We have to write our language. We have to write the language of the, the larger community. So people often have a negative evaluation of their own language. So if we take these five factors, and UNESCO has worked on developing um, scales to, to elaborate these, it's possible to come up with a typology of languages, actually a typology of language situations. The first type of language situation is where the language is viable or safe or strong. A strong language is one that's spoken by all age groups, learnt by children, and actively supported. As I said, the population could be quite small. It might be only 500 or 1,000 people, but the language is still strong and viable and will continue to be spoken. The second possibility is an endangered language. These are usually spoken by socially and economically disadvantaged minorities, and they are under heavy pressure from a larger language. In terms of the factors that we mentioned before, they are spoken by a reducing proportion of the population, not being learned by children, very often with negative evaluation and people deciding not to pass it on to their own um, children. Um, and these languages could disappear. The third category are moribund languages. These are languages that are not being learned by children at all, and that have very few older speakers with virtually no social function. Many Native American languages spoken in this country fall into that category. So this would be a language where a few old people speak it. Maybe when they get together and have a, have a party, uh, the old men will sit around and start talking about, oh, in the good old days, such and such happened, and they'll use their language. But in terms of everyday usage, it is virtually uh, disappearing. And the final category is extinct languages. So these are languages which have no native speakers at all. The name might be remembered, people might know a few words, but the language is not used in everyday communication. It's no longer an active means of language use. So we have these four categories of language situations. And what's been happening over the last 40 to 50 years 
is that languages have inexorably moved from being strong to endangered to moribund to extinct. Languages are disappearing at an, at a, um, an amazing rate through that process. There are several reasons why this happens. Why languages, why communities abandon their language and shift to another one. <coughs> the first kind of um, reason is what we could call external causes. These are factors that don't have to do with the individual community, but are really outside of it. Um, things like military conquest, um, the kind of um, civil war that has been going on in various parts of Africa has resulted in the destruction of whole communities. Um, this thing, the situation we're seeing in Congo at the moment, for example, is hugely threatening to language and cultural um, groups there. Religious, um, religious conflict also results in an impact on languages. People being told, convert to this religion, give up your old ways, give up your old language, become part of the modern world. And cultural and educational subjugation often associated with colonialist policies. So this was the history that you find in the United States, in Canada, in Australia. Children taken from their families, put in dormitories, told, you will have a better life if you stop speaking uh, Sioux or uh, Mohawk and instead you speak the bigger language. Or physical or medical catastrophes like HIV AIDS, which is decimating communities in Africa. These external causes, however, tend to have a smaller impact than internal causes, causes that factors that have to do with um, things happening inside the language itself. And by far, the greatest influence here is the negative attitude of the community. The speakers of the language judging their language negatively and valuing somebody else's language in a positive way. Often in order to overcome discrimination and to assimilate towards the majority. So in the United Kingdom, in the 1950s, 1950s and 1960s, this was the view of the Welsh speaking community. People in Wales said, adults said, let's talk English to our kids so that they'll be able to get out of this awful situation we're in. They'll be able to get good education good jobs, move out of the, the uh, depressed situation in the countryside in Wales, and so as a result, this negative evaluation resulted in people switching, speaking well, uh, Welsh only amongst adults and um, English to children. So this choice results in language shift, moving from one language, the first language or the <coughs> inherited language, through to the second one. Usually this takes place through a period of unstable bilingualism. Unstable because although people can speak two languages, they're much stronger in the one that they're shifting towards. And again, we saw this in Wales. Okay? There's a whole generation of people who speak a little bit of Welsh, but they're really str much stronger in, um, in English. The process can be catastrophic and take one or two generations. So you can get what is called radical language shift. It can take just one or two generations for a tip to occur like that. Let me give you an example of this. I was in New Mexico, in, um, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, in, 19, in 1980. And in 1980, you could walk around Albuquerque and you could hear Native American languages spoken everywhere. People would speak Navajo, you could hear Apache spoken on the streets. The community was quite strong, people were speaking it, kids were still learning it. The view of the Navajo community at that time was, we don't want bilingual education. We want our children to learn English. We'll speak Navajo at home, we'll keep the language going at home, but we want them to learn proper English at school. Today, one generation later, there are virtually no children who are learning Navajo as a first language. Okay? There was a shift in 20, well, what's that, 28 years. One generation has shifted so that the Navajos now 
have virtually no children learning their language at home as a first language. And this has been a total disaster in terms of um, the future directions for the Navajo language. It's taken, very, uh, taken place very quickly. In other communities, it's a more gradual change that can take even three or four or five generations to work through. But it often is inevitable once the change has taken place. So we have a worldwide pattern everywhere in the world of languages moving from safe to endangered to moribund to extinct. Now, some people would respond, this is not a problem. We have historical evidence that this has been going on for centuries. If you go back 2,000 years, you know the place, the Italian peninsula where, where Italy is? There were many, many languages spoken there. You had Oscan, Umbrian, Piceni, Etruscan, Gaulish, uh, Lombardia. There were all sorts of languages spoken there which have now been completely wiped out. For many of them, we know virtually nothing, maybe a few inscriptions, a few writings on a wall. That's all that remains because the Romans conquered that area and spread their language, Latin, which subsequently developed into Italian um, dialects and the Italian um, language. Many people will say to you, this is natural, this is normal, this is the way of the world. Languages are, have been changing like this for a very long period of time. The difference now is that in the last 200 years, and especially in the, the years since the Second World War, since the, the changes of uh, the, the decolonialization that has um, happened around the world, that this process of language shift and loss has speeded up at an enormous rate. The rise of hegemonic nation states, often with a monolingual ideology, right? One language, <coughs> one people, one country. That correlation is, was promoted, particularly in post-colonial states that wanted to argue in favor of um, homogeneous politics and, and to, um, to sort of support um, national identity by uh, covering over variation and wanting to have a single um, language. But we see this in Africa, many, many states in Africa promoting one language for their, for their area, or two or three languages as being the only possibility. This combined with globalization, the spread of global um, technology, the spread of global um, culture and global language has resulted in the process of language loss speeding up very, very rapidly, and increasingly um, languages disappearing. Um, the result is that within a given community, we can end up with different types of speakers. Fluent speakers who have full control over the language speak all of the different styles. They know how to speak, uh, how to make jokes, how to tell stories, how to read and write, and so on. A full control of the whole language. As the language reduces in its scope, and as the number of speakers diminishes, we see the emergence of semi-speakers, people with only partial control of the styles. Their vocabulary and lexicon often reduces, so they can't remember words for uh, particular aspects of uh, cultural things or parts of the environment. And often they have a passive competence as against an active one. They can understand when they hear older people speaking, but find it difficult to produce language themselves. The final kind of stage is people who we can call rememberers. People that no longer have active use of the language, but they can remember some words or expressions that they heard their parents or grandparents using. Many immigrant communities here in the US are in this position. If you've been here for two, three, four generations, you know words like, you know, the different words for food, that because your family cooks that kind of food, but you don't know how to speak the language. You can't put a sentence together, but you can remember individual words and so on. So what we're seeing is in language communities, going from fluent through semi-speaker to finally just a few words and memories remain. And that process, as I said, has happened and is happening everywhere around the world. Well, should we care about it? Should we worry about this? Well, clearly, 
you have an interest in this because you wouldn't be here if you didn't uh, if you weren't interested.